Hello everybody, my name is Wolf, and through this series of videos I'm going to explain to you the crazy, over-the-top world that nerds like me love so much, that is Warhammer 40,000. So get comfy, strap in, and prepare for a noobsplaining session. Back when 40k was on its first edition called Road Trader, the game was still very much in its infancy and a lot of the lore we have today just wasn't there or was very different. For example, the Primarchs were just generals and not the genetically engineered demigods we know and love today. Also, all of the armies could only use rhinos and land raiders as their vehicles and if you've seen any of my other videos you know how I feel about land raiders. Now Road Trader wasn't a grand battle game as it were, it was more of a skirmish tabletop RPG. As such, Games Workshop was still actively creating the rules, which were heavily inspired by their fancy battle system, then they made the lore, then they designed the models, which you think would be the normal way any company creating a game system would work, and they do. Around the time that 2nd edition was being planned, their mission statement as a company changed to something along the lines of, to produce the best miniatures in the world. This is when their mindset started to change into what it is today and how they go about making rules, law and models. Specifically that they make a model that they think is amazing and will thus make them money, they then make rules and law around that model. At the end of the day, Games Workshop is a capitalist company who exists just to make, well, all the money. And they have been very successful at this and I can't really hold that against them. It is this line of thinking of models first for profit, then rules and law, means they will happily drop a model from its lineup or an entire faction. So why is this relevant to the Space Dwarfs? Well, that's exactly what happened to them. Drop like a stone as they were no longer profitable. Now, I was going to introduce the Space Dwarfs with their formal names, as they were called back then Squats. But let's face it, that name is either somewhat a slur, or a crude attempt at dark humour due to them only being around 4 foot compared to the 6 to 8 foot for nearly every other fucking race, or worse, it was actually both. Originally, they were normal humans who left Earth long before it was united under the Imperium and long before they had access to warp travel. They were sent on a mission to the galactic core in vast generation ships to harvest all the resources of the core and bring them back to Earth. Yep, even in the grim dark of 40k, the space dwarfs still suffer from the stereotype of being miners and or weaponsmiths. Seriously, name me any fantasy or sci-fi setting with dwarves in it where the dwarves are not miners or weaponsmiths. Anyway, the Galactic Core has an abundance of stars and huge planets rich in resources. Due to the size of these planets, the gravity can be two or three times that of normal, and the excessive amount of stars means lots of solar radiation, resulting in the original humans evolving into the short, hardy race of space dwarves that were classed as official abhumans. This means they don't get shot on sight for being a mutant. As you can see on this map, the Squat homeworlds are located near the core where the Maelstrom is which is an area of space that is constantly covered in warp storms, thus pretty much a no-go zone. To the northeast we can see Baal, the Blood Angel's homeworld, and to the west Holy Terror, or Earth as we call it. North of Earth is the Eye of Terror, with its guards the space walls on their home planet of Fenris. Hang on, there's a system missing here. Ah oh, yeah, Cadia. Oh wait, it's not there anymore. And cue the triggering pure god players in the comments. Anyway, when the warp storm started due to the Eldar getting jiggy, the Galactic Core was one of the first places to be cut off. It is at this point the history of the faction becomes steeped in myth and their original mission to go fetch resources became a cultural desire to get resources and also a need to turn those resources into weapons and armour to protect their settlements from orcs or other invaders. Naturally those settlements also became strongholds, either planet or ship based. When designing the original models, Games Workshop certainly could not pick a style and stick to it. The initial rank and file troops were just fantasy dwarves with guns. They then ripped off current day mortar teams and then for some reason thought it would be perfect if they gave them a biker gang style and made all their vehicles Harley Davidson style custom choppers. Then to make things worse they made a box set of what was basically Imperial Guard at half height. The models were not great, not even for the time. Every other army at the time had a feel or a distinct style to it. All the tyrannies looked like official Games Workshop tyrannies. The Eldar looked like official Games Workshop Eldar. The Space Dwarves looked like that proxy army by several different manufacturers, each with conflicting ideas on how they should look like. Or they would have, if anyone actually fucking played them. I did originally think they had a Codex released for second, but it turns out I was wrong on that. 
It was planned. It was even mentioned in the Imperial Guard Codex, and their rules were in the core armourless books that came with the game, but the Codex itself never materialised. So seeing as nobody was playing them, it meant nobody was buying them. So they were not profitable, and thus somewhere around 93, possibly as late as 98, Games Workshop just stopped producing them and decided they were all eaten by Tyranids. And that was the end of the entire faction, gone and never to return. Thanks for watching, see you all next week. Of course, this wasn't the end of the story, far from it. Needless to say, the squad players were outraged and gutted at the same time, taking to the forums to vent their frustration. All fucking three of them. In a satirical take of the Doomsday Clock, this image from Games Workshop's head office made its way into the public, which goes to show that Games Workshop does pay attention to what the fans say, but most of the time they just fucking ignore us, as the image has on there the three main things fans were screaming for at the time. Ironically, they have gotten round to two of the things on that clock. I'm still waiting for a plastic Thunderhawk, and no, the Aeronautical Imperialis one doesn't count. For years, Games Workshop said they had no plans to bring them back, but did drop a few teasers here and there. In 2009, this model was given away with a 12-month subscription to White Dwarf, the official Games Workshop magazine. Then, in 2017, we got this to celebrate White Dwarf's 40th birthday. 40th birthday in 2017. Shit, I am old. And in 2019, we got this Christmas model, but still no sign of the faction's return. During the Psychic Awakening arc, the Eye of Terror became the Great Rift, or more formally, the Cicatrix Maledictum, probably named that because it's copyrightable. But the Eye expanded into a massive tear ripping the galaxy in half, unleashing chaos and demon armies everywhere. This was because the Imperial Guard failed to defend the most defensible planet in the setting. And cue even more triggered Imperial Guard players in the comments. Anyway, during this arc, an Imperial ship near the Galactic Core got stuck in a gravity-based weapon slash trap. When the people who set the trap came to investigate what they had caught, no doubt hoping it was a space hulk they can salvage, we were introduced to the leagues of Votan, referring to themselves as Kim. And just like that, they are back, and would you look at these? Even knowing nothing about them, you get the feeling these kin are tough, sturdy, and from their vehicles you can surmise they live in harsh environments and have to do a lot of exploring. If you did, you would be right on the mark. So after nearly 30 years of 40k, it's time to shoehorn them back in. So it turns out they didn't get eaten by the Tyranids, instead they just kept themselves to themselves, and as the core is notoriously difficult to navigate, everyone else just stayed away and forgot they existed. With the fall of Cadia because of the guard, and cue more triggered guard comments. I mean, I can't help but wonder if Abaddon's 13th Crusader targeted Fenris instead, Abaddon would no longer be in the setting. Anyway, the loss of Cadia led to the Great Rift tearing through the middle of League space, and suddenly they had lots of chaos and demon armies marauding around that they had to deal with. Lore-wise, they still have the same background as the original faction in the fact they were once humans who left on generational ships to become miners, and are very good at it. The high gravity means they are only half the height of a space marine, but arguably tougher. They also added in the Four Pillars, which is what each League society is built around, which is the Hearth, the Forge, the Fane, and the Crucible. The Hearth is the massive plasma reactor powering either their stronghold or ship. The Forge is where they make all their weaponry. The Fane is where the wisdom of the Votan flows from, which is actually an ancient AI device and the Crucible is where the cloning technology of the King is based, as you see every single one of them is a clone. Well, almost. You see, as well as the King, they also have another member of their society called the Iron King, who are sentient AI robots that are treated as equals and so they haven't rebelled and murdered everyone. Yet. They also still have the original STCs, or Standard Template Construction Machines. Now if the Imperium, specifically the Mechanicum, get wind of this, they would no doubt invade the Elite's homeworlds. You see, with just one STC, the Imperium would be able to mass-produce Land Raiders, Terminators rather, Titans, and all the other big powerful stuff that normally takes decades, if not longer, to produce a single item. And having just one would save the Imperium. So if the Leagues are abhumans and officially part of the Imperium, why not just hand a few over? Well, herein lies the dilemma. If we hand that level of power to the Imperium and save it, well, that's the setting over, as the whole point of it being grim dark is humanity is just clutching onto survival and permanently on the brink of collapse. Also, there are just as many in the Imperium that don't think the Leagues are part of the Imperium, so eventually its guns will be turned on the Leagues. 
Likewise, some of the leagues no longer consider themselves to be part of the Imperium, and instead just see them as someone to trade with at best, or a target to raid for resources at worst. I love how Games Workshop have taken the original lore and expand on it around the look and feel of the models. I could genuinely believe that these models were made around the lore and not the other way around. The fact they are half the size of Primaris Marines would raise some challenges when painted, as you can see how detailed they are. They have a higher toughness and strength than the Space Marines to depict they come from high graph planets, but also have a lower move rate, which is just nonsensical against actual physics, as in a normal graph battlefield they would move significantly faster than anyone else. As for weapons, they all mainly use Bolter and Volkite weapons. Volkite weapons are what Space Marines had before Bolters, but Volkite weapons are complex to operate and require significant and intensive maintenance due to complex and delicate internal components. If you know anything about the military, you know you never give a soldier something that has the word delicate in its description, as you can guarantee they will find a million ways to break the fucking thing. As an army they are very tough, and only slightly slower than any other army, and while they don't have a massive choice of troops, I mean, apart from their characters, they have one normal infantry unit, one melee infantry unit, one heavy infantry unit, and one heavy weapons infantry unit, a scout bike, a transport, and a heavy tank, and that's it. Which, I definitely want one of those tanks, but not until I have a land raider. But hey, they're only a year old, so no doubt they will get more models added to the range over time. Being the most recent army to be released just before 10th, they did suffer from the power creep and were initially insanely tough and able to dish out as much as they could take. But like most armies, they were rebalanced for 10th. Overall, they are still very tough, if slightly slower moving than any other army, but not by much, and there is not a lot they can't go toe to toe with and come out on top. And they are another great example of how to make a faction and fit it into the current setting. Arguably, they were already there and were just resurrected, but with a stunning set of models, once again proving that Games Workshop are the best model producers in the world. So if you're listening to Games Workshop, I really, really want a Land Raider. And there we have it. That brings us to the end of this video. If you laughed or learned anything, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you are already subscribed, then don't forget to share this video with somebody who could do with some noob explaining in their life. Also, leave a comment on your favourite part. I do try and interact with every comment. But if you made it this far, thank you, and I'll see you next time.